We've been doing the past several weeks a series of messages that we've called Beyond. And the big idea of Beyond is the fact that God is on the move. God is not static. He's, he's not stuck in status quo mode. He's alive. He's moving. He has plans for you and for me and for this present world. And he's working those plans out all the time, every day. And he's looking for people who will join him where he is already at work, who are willing to go beyond. Henry Blackaby gave the church a gift uh, many years ago when he wrote a book called Experiencing God. And one of the phrases that Henry Blackaby taught the body of Christ was not to pray, God bless what I'm doing, but to pray, Lord, help me to do what you're blessing. And that's a whole different perspective, isn't it? Not praying, God bless what I'm doing, but saying, Lord, I want to join you where you're already at work. I want to do what you are blessing. And that's the idea of going beyond. This means that God's always leading us forward. He leads us out of our comfort zones to places we've never been. And I believe it's time to go beyond because our world needs churches to go beyond. This church needs to go beyond. I need to go beyond. You need to go beyond, beyond where we are right now because we cannot become what we need to be by remaining what we are. So Jesus shows up. And when Jesus shows up in, in, in history and he begins his ministry, he walks along and he says two words that interrupted lives, that changed lives. Two very simple words. He said them first to fishermen along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He said, follow me. And they did. He was in Jerusalem and he saw Levi or Matthew, the tax collector. And he said, hey, follow me. And through those two words and people actually doing that, getting up and following Jesus, which means if you want to be a Christian, if you want to be a Christ follower, that you actually follow Jesus. What a novel thought, right? In other words, we, we go, we grow, we change, we go beyond to become like him. It's so easy to get stuck in ruts, to get mired in old habits, to get stuck in the ways of sin, the ways of the world, the ways of self. But if we listen to the pages of Scripture and we truly meet the Jesus that is revealed there and we come together in community, we hear his voice even today calling us like he called those first disciples and he says, follow me. So far in this series, we've looked at these topics. We've talked about following and going beyond ourselves going beyond me, going beyond the old life, going beyond our comfort zones, going beyond the walls of the building. And last week we talked about going beyond racial zones. Today we're going to see how God leads us to take the radical, life-changing, community-transforming, family-healing, marriage-altering message of the good news of Jesus beyond words, beyond words. Everybody say those two words with me right now, beyond words. In other words, the means, the ways, the methods we use to tell and spread the message of Jesus, that's important. How you and I live out our faith and express this new life that Jesus calls us to is really important. Specifically, we're called to do that in a way that goes beyond words, just beyond verbiage that comes out of our mouths to a total way of life with acts of service and Christ-like care that make the words we say real and impacting. You've probably heard this before, but I'm going to say it again because it's one of those things that I heard many years ago and it's impacted my life. And it's a little saying that goes like this. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Have you heard that before? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's why Jesus tells us that part of following him sometimes means just bringing a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus and offering that. Because when you do that, when you do acts of service like that, that meet people's needs, that action is a picture of the heart of God for broken people in this world that is worth a thousand words. Rick Warren, who's the author of the best-selling book, Purpose Driven Life, he said, the body of Christ has had its hands and feet amputated until all that's left is a big mouth. The world has heard us preach for so long, but it's been word without deed. Now, when Jesus launched his earthly ministry, he didn't just go around making speeches like a political candidate running for office. He, 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 didn't, just go about, he just didn't go around talking about what God is up to. As important as his teaching and preaching was, you can't read how Jesus brought the up there kingdom down here on earth and miss the fact that it went beyond words. He lived it 
out. He expressed it through his life, and now he tells us who follow him today to do the same, so that together with him in our midst, we can form a special kingdom of God community that puts flesh on the message and makes it real where the rubber meets the road on the streets of the real world. Now, here's a passage we're going to kind of look at today to introduce us to what we want to talk about beyond words. It's in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. It is a great summary at the beginning of Jesus' ministry of how Jesus lived And how Jesus made disciples. And it begins like this. Jesus went throughout Galilee. Galilee is that northern region of Israel. Above the Samaritan region. Above the Jerusalem Judean region. Galilee is where Nazareth is. Nazareth is where Jesus grew up. His hometown. Capernaum. All those areas in the cities in the region of Galilee. He went throughout all those areas. Traveling to many locales. And specifically Jesus did three things. He was teaching. He was teaching in their synagogues. Jesus always went into synagogues as he had opportunity, and he taught. In other words, his teaching helped explain some things. He was a new kind of teacher. He was a teacher who taught as one who had authority, not like the religious leaders of their day. So Jesus explained some concepts about who the father was and who he was. We've got to help people understand some things to get through to their head, to engage their minds. We're to love the Lord our God with all of our mind, okay, and and strength and soul. All right, so he did teaching. Then he, he, he was preaching the good news of the kingdom. He was teaching in their synagogues, and he was preaching the good news of the kingdom. In other words, he went beyond just explaining things. He gave a challenging message intended to motivate people to change, to go beyond. He was affecting not only the head, but he was appealing to the heart. Sometimes people say, hey, what's the difference between teaching and preaching? Well, we're kind of splitting hairs in some ways. But if you push to ask me, I would say teaching is more explanation. Teaching is more the, the helping you understand some things in a little clearer way. It's, it's, it's explanation. Preaching is more motivation. Preaching is, is intended to be a little bit more inspiration, to appeal to the heart and to the emotions. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, it says they were cut to the heart. That's what good preaching does. It cuts to the heart. But Jesus did not just spend all of his time teaching and preaching, or even the majority of his time, I think, teaching and preaching. I want you to look at the rest of the verse, Matthew 4 healing every disease and sickness among the people. In other words, Jesus met people where they were. He met people's needs. He could look into their world and he knew they were broken. He knew they were in need. And he brought a message that was practical and life-giving and life-changing. He brought the power of God to transform lives and communities and families. And he engaged people's hands. So you can see with Jesus' approach, he engaged the head. He engaged the heart. He engaged the hands of people. And this is what we call a holistic approach, a holistic approach to ministry. It's not just words that we say without actions to back it up. It's not just good deeds or kind actions without clear explanation of the truth paired with it. It's head, heart, and hands. That's holistic. That's how Jesus does ministry. That's how Jesus brings the kingdom of God to people. Francis of Assisi, or Assisi, was a 13th century Italian Catholic priest who gave up great wealth from his family to establish a monastic order dedicated to bringing the gospel to the poor. And he made this powerful statement, perhaps you've heard before. St. Francis said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Now, somewhere along the way, unfortunately, Christians has started reducing the message of Jesus to just words. And we began to think that if we said the right words, if we affirmed the right phrases, we were Christians. Saying some words or saying a prayer or repeating an affirmation of faith or a catechism made me a Christian. So if you wanted to make someone else a disciple, you just talked to them and you got them to say the right words. And we began to pay a lot of attention to the words, the exact words about who Jesus was and about what we believed about him. In fact, if you didn't get the words right, you weren't considered a real believer. And words are very important. Don't hear what I'm not saying. We must handle the scriptures accurately. We must preach the word with authority and clarity. But here's the point. Our proclamation of the gospel has got to go beyond words. It's got to go beyond words. 
This is why Jesus would tell stories as he talked to people and he wanted people to understand how the kingdom of God, the presence of God living among people on this earth right now through him. He told stories and he told stories like the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. Anybody remember the Good Samaritan story in Luke chapter 10? You vaguely familiar with that one? A man is attacked by robbers as he travels along a dangerous road. He's left for dead by his assailants as he lies in a pool of his own blood alongside the road. Some religious people come by. Priests, Levites, religious people. And what do they do? They pass by on the other side. Despite all their religious training, their religious thoughts, the, the words that they had in their heads or maybe even memorized in their heart, the fact is they didn't do anything. They don't help. They don't extend compassion in real and practical ways. They don't bring the grace and power and love of God to the man laying in the ditch. Maybe they were thinking, I've got a message to deliver. Maybe they were saying, I got a worship service. I'm late to it. I got to get to. I've got a ritual. I've got to perform. I've got a ceremony where someone needs my blessing. But Jesus says the real neighbor in the story, the one who looks the most like the kingdom, the most like Jesus in the story is a Samaritan man. Now, if you weren't here last week and you didn't hear the message about going beyond racial zones, you need to, you need to hear that for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is the Jewish people, the pure-blooded Jewish people in Jesus' day, they despised the Samaritans. They considered them half breeds They wanted nothing to do with them. And so when Jesus tells a story about who is my neighbor, who does he make the hero of the story? Not the priest, not the Levi, but a Samaritan man. Why is that? What exactly did this Samaritan do that earned him the distinction of forever being labeled as the good Samaritan? Well, he didn't stand over the man and preach to him. He didn't tell him where he went astray by putting himself in a vulnerable position. He didn't write a post on Facebook about the problem with gangs along the road. He didn't tell the man you should have AAA for situations like this. What did he do? Well, first of all, it says he got down off his donkey. There's another older translation that says he got down off something else. You understand what I'm saying? He got down, and maybe that's where we need to begin. We get off of our donkey, so to speak. Maybe that's part of what we need to begin with. We get off of our donkeys, and he... He, he met the man where he was. He, he put him on his donkey. He took him to get the medical attention he needed. He stayed with him for a while. He paid the bill. He said, I've got to go for a couple of days. I'll come back for you. owes you something else. I'll take care of it. Jesus says, this is what it looks like to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And it's what it means to love beyond words. Beyond words. Journey Christian Church is involved in God's work around the world. We, we call this missions sometimes because we're on a mission to bring Jesus' love everywhere. And wherever we are, we want our proclamation of Jesus to go beyond words. And so how do we practically do that as we live this out in our congregation? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today. The first thing I want to talk to you about is this. For some time, it's been on my heart to have someone to come and specifically lead our missions ministry, to lead uh, our community outreach efforts. So for the first time in Journey's history, beginning in 2014, we will have a pastor, a full-time pastor, who will be our pastor of community outreach and missions. Very excited about this. I want to introduce him to you today. This is Ryan Tucker. Ryan is uh, from Apopka, and uh, he'll be coming back here to join us. This is his wife, Megan, and the daughter is Kendall, and then we have Hudson and Griffin. We wanted a man on our staff who could grow a real beard. I mean, look at that. You could hide a picnic basket in that thing. I mean, that's a real beard right there. What is Ryan going to be doing as the pastor of community outreach and missions ministry? Ryan will provide visionary, energetic, creative, pastoral, and strategic leadership of local and global outreach ministries at Journey Christian Church. Because we understand community outreach and mission ministries as actions, words, programs that act as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, reaching out to serve, to embrace, and to love the world starting in our own community. And so we're excited to tell you about uh, Ryan joining us, and I want you to pray for him. He's moving here right after New Year's, and uh, right after Christmas, I should say, and uh, joining us uh, in the 1st of January. Let me tell you something else. Over the past three years here at Journey, we uh, have received 
uh, since I've been the pastor at Journey, we've received a Christmas offering that we give away to missions, but not just any missions. We, we have some strategic, strategic mission partnerships with people in all different parts of the world and here in the U.S. who are ministering in the name of Jesus in holistic ways that we love partnering with, in ways that tell the love of God expressed through Jesus Christ beyond words. So here's what I thought that we would do today during this special weekend before Christmas and before we receive our Christmas offering in just a little bit. I thought it would be good to revisit the recipients of the first three Christmas offerings to show you where the funds you have given and we have given, where they've gone, and how that money has been used to make an impact for the kingdom of God that goes beyond words. Does that sound like a good thing to do? That's what we're going to do anyhow, so you might as well not, okay? Occasionally, you'll see a magazine as you go through a retail center, and you'll see a magazine, and it'll say, where are they now? You ever see those magazines? Where are they now? Child stars of the 80s, where are they now? In prison. No, but where, <laughs> who really cares where are they are now? We care, and, I, and you should care. Hey, we've given generously and sacrificially in the past. Where have those funds gone, and how have they impacted kingdom of God good. Well, let's start. In 2010, we took up our Christmas offering for Faith in Action Ministries in Guatemala. Michael and Rocky Bean have been missionaries in the Central American country of Guatemala for 28 years. Their mission works in many regions of the country, from the mountains of Montesano and Pinalito to the city of Zacapa, below those mountain areas, to a remote river area called Rio Dulce, reaching people who have never heard of Jesus before. And our very first Christmas offering, we took it up to help put a second floor on a dorm in Zacapa. And so I asked their mission to uh, just give us a, a visual update. And here's what they sent. Watch this. Who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night? Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's awesome. That first uh, Christmas offering, we not only took up money, we took up some jewelry. Some of you remember that? We, gold price was going way up, and we took some, some, uh, some gold and got that exchanged and then added that, and we were able to pour the a team of us went down, and I was a part of that team. We were able to pour the, the concrete on that. The floor. I cut a mile of wire that, uh, that week to tie rebar together. I want to tell you something, I've never worked that hard in my life. We worked hard, but it was good to see. We, we love what Michael and Rocky are doing, and uh, more, more people from Journey have gone on short-term mission trips to Guatemala than any other place in the last few years. Last year, for the first time, six young adults from Journey did a mission internship uh, with Faith in Action. 
lasting at least a month. Some were there a couple of months in Guatemala. They're dear brothers and sisters. And I'm happy to tell you today that next year we plan to double our monthly mission support to Faith in Action Ministry uh, because we love what they're doing. So... In 2011, our Christmas offering for missions went to an organization called Core Foundation. Some of you remember the Chicken Coops for the Soul Project? You remember us talking about that? This was in Haiti. Dennis Bratton is a former preacher of Christ Church in Jacksonville, Florida. He started Core to go beyond bringing relief to the suffering poor of Haiti to helping them bring a sustain, a way to sustain themselves. Core focuses on a step beyond relief because here's what happens and you've seen it happen and I've seen it happen. In times of catastrophe, if there's a tsunami, if there's an earthquake, if there's a tornado, if there's a hurricane, the church and many other people respond with tremendous generosity. But then what happens? What sustainable good has our generosity achieved? There is a time for relief, but CORE focuses on the step beyond relief, beyond the short-term offerings that fade as quickly as the donations are exhausted. CORE seeks to offer poverty-stricken people a sustainable alternative. With the introduction of creative micro-industries in agriculture and aquaculture, CORE's vision is to enable people the dignity of self-reliance and sustainability without outside support. And wouldn't we want everybody to be able to do that? Dennis Bratton and his partner, Etzel Redman with Fish Ministries, based in Christianville in Haiti, began to build chicken coops that set local Haitian Christians up in their own chicken raising business. Let's catch up. Been a preacher for about 40 years. And a year and a half ago, my wife and I began a foundation called CORE. We had been struck by the real burden of extreme poverty. The quickest and the simplest tool we found is a little chicken coop. In six weeks, a little chick grows to about four and a half pounds and is ready for market. The Haitian farmer can make in that six weeks what he makes in a year's time. My name is Robinson and I am Christian. We are in charge of the Small Older Poetry Project for Core Foundation in Haiti. And I am Raymond, the new campus pastor. I am here to work with farmers and their families. Now we have 90 uh, coops uh, that are producing and we are about to add 20 more in the near future. I have one of my farmers that tell me about uh, his testimony. He said that uh, that project is a blessing for him because he never find this quantity of money in his hand, and in his hand before. The dollars given to CORE are invested in a Haitian family and repaid, and then they're invested again in another family, and the dollars given to CORE never stop working. Thank you again, and we hope to see you very soon in Haiti. We took up that offering, and then a couple months later, a team of about 12 of us went down to build some chicken coops. We took up enough money to build about 30 or 50 of these chicken coops. And, uh, you know, 12 American guys going down for, you know, four days, we figured we're going to put up 14, 15 of these chicken coops real quick. Uh, if you've never been to Haiti, and I had never been at that time, it's just hard to describe the dysfunction of the whole country. But... Everything is harder in Haiti. It just, it's just hard to get it done. We got four or five coops built in that three or four day period. And that was more than any other church had done that had come down. Another team went down later on in the year. They built four or five more coops in about a two or three day period. And they tell us from CORE that Journey Christian Church, nobody's built more chicken coops than we have. We are the champion chicken coop builders. I want you to know that, Journey. I'm good with putting that on my tombstone. Champion chicken coop builder right there, okay? So if you need chicken coops built, you let me know. I got a team of guys. We'll take care of you. CORE is doing a great work, and uh, this coming year, for the first time, we're going to include them in our regular mission support uh, budget. We're going to give them $500 a month to their ongoing uh, work in, in the country of Haiti. Last year, in 2012, our Christmas offering went to a local mission that is dear to Journey uh, Christian 
Just as you are ministries, Alan Sue Hoover founded and lead just as you are ministry to women who are incarcerated at the Orlando Work Release Center. Each Sunday, just at our 930 service, dozens of women in these first three or four rows here and several volunteers from Jaya, they worship with us on a regular basis. Dozens, probably Al told me before the last service, over 100 women from that ministry from Orlando Work Release Center through Just As You Are. A hundred women have been baptized into Christ right here in this baptistry in the past three years, which is awesome. I got a letter. I got a letter from one of the ladies who worshiped a journey for two years, and then she finished her sentence, and she was released, and she's, uh, she's gone uh, back to Oklahoma. And um, here's what she wrote me. Brother John, you may not remember me, but my name is Lila Barber. I was one of Mrs. Sue and Mr. Al Hoover's girls. I would like to thank you for believing in me, well, us, for letting me know God still loves me. I hadn't been to church for a long time, but y'all made me at home. She's obviously from the South, y'all, okay? Um, I will never forget the feeling I felt there. I was home. To be honest, I'm afraid I have lost the happiness. I know God is still with me, but in my heart, I believe I belong there. Mrs. Sue had told me to pray and ask God for guides. I did. He led me to care for my family. I felt stuck once again, but God knew his plan. I was to tell my father about him. It's a wonderful feeling to be able to see my father know and accept God in his life. You see, my father has prostate cancer in the last stages. Yeah, I'm going to miss him, but by the grace of God, I know he will be with him. Thank you for giving me the strength and the tools I needed. I love you. Please tell Mr. Al and Mrs. Sue I love them and miss all of you. Also, please tell the other women in in Jaya, and I was able to do that this morning at 930. Hang on to God, even when it feels he ain't there. He is. God bless with love. Lila Barber. Yeah, isn't that awesome? Al, Al and Sue had a vision to, to create a re-entry residence for women who are finishing their sentences in prison. And so often these ladies are being released without a, without a stable and healthy environment to go back to. And as Sue says, they're set up for failure before they even start. So... Last year, we took our offering, our Christmas offering, and we had gave them the funds to remodel a home on the corner of Hiawassee and uh, Balboa. And uh, here's the update. I would like to uh, introduce you to the Jaya House. My name is Sue Hoover, and I'm the director here alongside with my husband, Al. It was a vision of ours for a long time, both Al and I. We go into their Orlando Work Release Center, and we see many women come out of incarceration, and they have nowhere to go and they fail before they even get started. So this house was a considered, we wanted it to be a transition house, a place where they could come and transition as easily as possible with the love and the nurturing of Jesus Christ. When I left the work release, I ended up moving into the transition home with Ellen Sue. That was one of the best things that happened to me. I learned so much. I wasn't here long, but I transitioned and I went to a sober house. My whole entire prison sentence, I was a very stubborn person. Can't say that I'm not still stubborn, but I still go to Journey Christian Church. I love it there. I wouldn't pick another church. Because of Sue and Al and the church and my AA and my sobriety today, my family talks to me again. I'm starting to get a relationship with my kids that I didn't have before. My dad talks to me, and that's a big deal because he never talked to me before. There's nothing easy about transformation, yeah. but with Christ, anything's possible, oh, and that's what our um, that's what we learn here. No, we're living proof of that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. When I moved to my own place, I had nothing. Al, Sue, and all the volunteers of Journey helped me. Now I have a house full of stuff, so much stuff, to it's like it's amazing. Um, Al and Sue has really been a blessing to me. I wouldn't change this life that I'm living right now for nothing in the world. You know, I'm glad I did go to prison because if I wouldn't have went to prison, I would have never met Alice Sue. I never would have met the people at Journey Christian Church. I can't tell you the amount of stories that we hear about these women that have, were in church years ago. They come, they haven't been in church in several years. They walk into Journey and they immediately feel at home. And it's amazing because 
You know, the presence of the Holy Spirit is there, and you know, you can see that, but more importantly, our church, Journey Christian Church, you can feel the work oh, of the yeah. you can feel the Lord at work, the Holy Spirit, you can feel that presence there when they come in. And it's just an amazing thing for them to experience. Without the support of our journey family, this could have never happened. No so no it's such a tremendous witness for everyone here concerned. And we're so grateful and thankful. Yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. Great work God's doing there. And I'm happy to announce today that next year, we'll be increasing our monthly support to Jaya by 50% uh, just to help them continue their work as well. This year, our Christmas offering is going to be split between two recipients. Both of them are related to establishing healthy local congregations to reach people in the name of Jesus in a way that goes beyond words. First of all, the first recipient is our Journey Christian Church Extension Campus in Mount Dora. We've talked about this quite a bit. We'll talk about it more next week as we do a commissioning service for those who are taking the journey DNA from Apopka over to Mount Dora. But I want to just go over some things very quickly. A multi-site is one church that meets in multiple locations. That can be different rooms on the same campus. It can be different locations in the same region. In some instances, it's different cities, different states, or different nations. A multi-site church shares a common vision, common budget, and a common leadership. The DNA, what, what, what is at the heart of Journey Christian Church? Our vision, our mission, our values. They will stay the same regardless of location, regardless of campuses. Practical, relevant, hope-giving, biblical teaching. Contemporary, energetic, and excellent music. Fun, safe, family-centered children's ministry. Simple, obvious, strategic next steps for growth in your life-changing journey with Jesus. And blessing our community, whether we're in Apopka or in Mount Dora. In other words, if we disappeared tomorrow, would people miss us? Multi-site is more about vision than it is about size. So fundamentally, we are extending our DNA, our vision, into an area that is close enough for us to reach in proximity with our message and yet distant enough to be distinct in ministering to a different community. Our vision, whether it's Journey Apopka, Journey Mount Dora, or Journey wherever it may be in the future, is to develop a growing community of people on a life-changing journey journey with Jesus Christ. To fulfill that vision, we need to see beyond where and who we are right now. And whether that launch team on January the 5th in Mount Dora High School, whether that launch team is 100 or 200 or 300 or something else, the reality is we're not doing it for the people who are already with us. We're doing it to reach people who aren't there yet. Let me give you very quickly some advantages of multi-site ministry. It assists in reaching friends and family unwilling to travel a great distance to church. Maybe you drive over from Eustace here to Journey of Popka and you're good with that, but probably your neighbor may not be as agreeable to do that. This will make it a lot easier to invite them to join you in a church close to them. It brings together the best aspects of larger churches, which, is, which are proven systems and resources, and smaller churches, which is more personal involvement and a stronger sense of community. It enables untapped talent to emerge each time a new venue or site is opened. It mobilizes volunteers through an added variety of ministry opportunities. I told the Saturday night service last uh, night when I, as I was talking to them, two years ago, we didn't have a Saturday night service, and many of those people who serve on Saturday night, they weren't serving at that time that maybe they had sat in the two worship services that we did on Sundays and and they thought well it looks like they got everything covered in guest services and children's ministries it looks like they're good but when we open up Saturday night we said you know what we need more people to step up and they did and we have a whole team of people who serve in children's ministry and in guest services and in worship facilitation who weren't serving before the same thing's going to happen in Mount Dora there are going to be people who haven't been serving but they're going to they're going to step up because the opportunity is there and the need is there. It improves a church's stewardship of funds and resources. Someone put it like this. Do the quick math, he wrote. If it costs seven or eight million dollars to build a large building like this, we could launch multiple campuses for that same amount and reach a whole lot more people closer to their homes. 
It enables a church to extend itself into surrounding communities, and it provides a pipeline for development of emerging leaders and future staff. Pastor Joel has already been active in the Mount Dora community. He's taught in Mount Dora High School. We're helping with a Category 5 store in uh, Mount Dora High School. That's for students in need of clothing and food and hygiene products. This postcard that looks like this, it says, Merry Christmas from Journey Christian Church, Journey Mount Dora, and it invites people. 10,000 homes received this card a couple of weeks ago in Lake County to invite people to join us on January the 5th uh, for our opening services at 1030 uh, uh, in uh, Mount Dora High School. Pray that we get a good response uh, to this card. We have weekly ads in the Lake Sentinel twice a week. We're ha- going to have soon have a front page article in the Triangle News Leader. And Monday evening, the past two Monday evenings have been prayer times that uh, Pastor Joel has been leading with the launch team. They're doing it again tomorrow night on Monday night from 7 to 8 and every Monday night until the launch. And if you'd like to know more about that, see Joel, and I'm sure they'd love to have you there. The other recipient of our Christmas offering is going to be a church plant in the South American country of Ecuador. This church plant in Ecuador will be located along the northwest coastal area of the country known as Esmeraldas. Esmeraldas is a major seaport of northwestern Ecuador. It lies on the Pacific coast at the mouth of the Esmeraldas River. The city is a principal trading hub for the region's agricultural and lumber resources. It's the terminus of a 313-mile trans-Ecuadorian pipeline from the oil fields in northeastern Ecuador. Given the large number of locals that have historically played in the Ecuadorian national football team, and you do know outside of America, football means soccer, right? That's what it means. They play on the soccer team. Esmeraldas is well known around Latin America for the number of quality soccer players that that region produces. The population of Metro Esmeraldas is 190,000. The average temperature is 82 for a high, 74 for the low. I don't know why that was interesting to me, but it sounded like South Florida, okay? I had the privilege of meeting the director of a network of pastors in the area back in January when I was in Ecuador. I met this man. I prayed for him. He was a humble, spirit-filled man. And I immediately wanted to help him. And I'm so blessed that we're going to partner and help bring a church plant to his area and help him reach people who are far from God and change the future of children who will in turn change the future of their country. We're partnering with two great organizations, Stadia and Compassion International, to plant this church. While I was in Ecuador visiting with other church plants who are going to be who are already doing what the church we're helping plant is going to be doing, I had an opportunity to to spend some time with the presidents of Stadia and Compassion. And we shot this video. Listen. A rare opportunity and a great blessing for me today. I'm staying here with the presidents of Stadia. This is my dear friend, Greg Nettle. He and I have been friends for many years back to Bible college days. Greg's president of Stadia. And this is uh, Wes Stafford. And Wes is the president of Compassion International. And I met Wes uh, back six years ago when I came on a similar trip to this. And what we're doing here is really unique. God is doing such a cool thing about all this. First with a Compassion program and with a church plant. Wes, uh, just a little bit about Compassion's partnership with Stadia and how that's happened here in Ecuador. Yeah, well, everything starts with friendship. This is like my brother, and we have been friends for a good many years now. I got to tell you, you got a very cool pastor, John. It has been fun traveling with him. You know, Compassion exists as a servant to the church, uh, helping them reach out to the children in some extremely poverty-stricken situations. And so we need a church in order to have a partner. And that's where Stadia comes in. These incredibly courageous people come into places where there is no church and build up the local capacity of the church. Compassion comes alongside and does its program in that brand new church. We're looking at a place that's only a couple of years old. And uh, all these children you see around here, children who are sponsored by people just like you and are on their way to, uh, to changing equity. It's a, it's a pretty exciting part of the kingdom here. Absolutely. So, Journey, thank you for your partnership. Um, 
I miss John deeply up in uh, beautiful Canton, Ohio, where I live. Uh, though I love coming down and visiting him, I hope I'll get to be with you soon. Yeah. We love this partnership, but we love partnering with you. So thank you for caring about the children of the world, specifically through new church planting. <laughs> Journey is going to be a great partnership, and I'm so excited to be able to uh, bring this back, share a little bit more in person on this. But I just wanted you to see uh, what God is doing uh, all around the world. And it's through partnership, and it's in the name of Jesus. Thanks, guys. Hmm. Hmm. Th throughout this year, we've been setting aside $3,000 a month uh, from our missions budget toward that project. It's $85,000 for that plot of ground and to build that building that you see. And... Uh, we believe that we are going to receive the remaining funds to finish that project off in this weekend's Christmas offering. And let me say this to you. In March of 2014, the children from that church plant that we're helping establish, they'll be ready for sponsorship. And we will have a Compassion Weekend on March the 1st and 2nd of 2014 to sponsor the 200 children that will be reached through Compassion and their program, and will help fund a child survival program for infants and moms in that same region. I've said this to you before. I want to say it to you one more time before we close. If we reach our goal of $100,000 this weekend, we will have completely funded the building project in Ecuador, and we will have the rent paid for Mount Dora High School, where we're going to worship, and for the Mount Dora, uh, the Journey Mount Dora offices for an entire year. I don't know about you, but that's what I call going beyond words. Amen? I want you to stand with me right now. You know, we often talk about Jesus' last words to his followers. Jesus' last words to his followers are very important. We've given them a special name. We call them the Great Commission. Jesus was saying, I want you to go. But I think we tend to forget about Jesus' first words to people. The first words to, that Jesus spoke publicly to people who wanted to know who he was. What's he about? What is he bringing? I think these words should be called the great introduction. They're found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Jesus is in the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. They hand him the scroll to read. He un folds the scroll, and he reads from the prophet Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus said, this day, this is fulfilled in your midst. Jesus was saying, this is who I am. This is why I've come. This is what I'm about. I want to introduce you to the kingdom of God. Journey, I pray that that's a part of our DNA and will always be. So Journey Christian, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we uh, are able to gather here this morning and we're able, to, we're able to understand a little bit more about engaging our heads, our hearts, our hands, and our feet in making known your love, your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, your transforming power, the way that you alter lives the way that you say with very two simple, very, uh, very simple words, follow me. Lord, I pray that, that we will be followers of you in our community, not only proclaiming, but extending ourselves, our hands, our resources, our lives. Not only in our community, but in our state, in our country, in Guatemala, in Ecuador in Haiti. Lord, we thank you for those precious folks that we partner with. We pray you'll bless their ministries. We pray that you'll keep reaching 
more and more people, drawing them to yourself as we seek to minister beyond words. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.